Hello everyone, welcome to Bread and Roses. I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about women's periods. It's 8th March coming up soon, International Women's Day protests. And particularly, we're going to talk about a short documentary that just won the Oscar on what was it? Women's periods. Interviews this week, it's on uh, fatwa against Salman Rushdie. 30 years after that incident, we'll be speaking to a few women who have a lot to say about this issue. Stay with us, don't go away. The Oscar this year for a short documentary was given to a film called Period, End of Sentence, about women's periods in a rural village in India. And uh, the director of this short documentary is an Iranian, Reka Zehtabchi, who went up on stage to receive the prize. And she said, I'm not crying because I have my period uh, right now, but because a film about periods has actually won an Oscar. And I think that is quite a historical thing, isn't it? Absolutely. 21st century, we have to uh, discuss this. And this is an issue that uh, um, women face everywhere. Uh, societies face a a everywhere. And the film is about the uh, rural sort of village in India, um, how women are struggling uh, to deal with issue with this issue, and uh, trying to unpick various aspects of this, uh, uh, you know, this taboo effectively uh, in society, and it opens up this discussion. And I think this is a great moment. And it's eighth uh, of March is coming as well, and it's apt and, and and the right moment. And this issue is not just in India; it's many other countries mm. as well. When you when you look at it, yeah. I mean, in India, of course, there are. Uh, all of these incidences where just recently a 12-year-old girl committed suicide because uh, she had blood stains on her clothes and the teacher embarrassed her in front of the class. And we've heard of women in Nepal, for example, being uh, relegated to huts while they had their period. Uh, m many of them suffocate in those huts with their children. Uh, and of course, we know it's not just Hinduism, um, as in India, for example, it's also other religions, Judaism, uh, sections of Buddhism, um, Orthodox Christianity, and of course Islam, where you know women um, can't pray, they can't go to the mosque, um, they can't have sex, they can't even get a divorce, for example, yeah, while they've got their period. Absolutely, and men are supposed to sort of keep away from yeah. them and, and effectively uh, distance themselves, and they are unclean, uh, and you could see that in various religions and various societies as well. And you've had this throughout the history. And is still with us, uh, unfortunately, and that's something that it needs to be needs to be challenged. The challenge is there. I think one of the aspects of this is the language, and how language is used to uh, uh, to describe this and challenging the language because the uncleanness of it, the uh, um, uh, poisonous nature of this is is always in the language. Even normally, when people are uh, describing period, the alert, uh, the red alert to you know anything red, anything sort of dangerous, mm -hmm. you know, is the time of the month you know that you you're not supposed to sort of uh, uh, you have to keep away. Even normal, where even people who are not religious, you'll see the very uh, ingrained in, in in the culture, the misogyny of the language. I think language is one of those ask that aspects that needs to, uh, uh, needs to be challenged uh, uh, here. And you can see uh, um, with the reports of the, uh, uh, about the prize given to the documentary, uh, uh, one of the uh, people who were supposed to vote for uh, the films they refused to vote for this, for this uh, um, short documentary uh, and his argument was that this was a woman talking about period uh, and uh, for men this is icky. icky and so that ickiness is the language ingrained, uh, ingrained in many many uh, so societies. So it's not just India yeah. and Iran and Absolutely. so on, it's also in Western society. Absolutely and you, you could see that every day uh, in, in European and uh, North American countries as well. Yeah and, and I mean this taboo is quite um, important for women and girls' lives because it is a question of life and death in many situations because this sort of exclusion, uh, you know, the sort of uh, relegating, segregation, the humiliation, all of it that 
is wrapped around something that's very, very natural, uh, is something that needs to be challenged. And, and unfortunately, you know, you would think we're living in the 18th century or something, that we still need to have these discussions. But obviously, clearly we do. And I think given that it is 8th March coming up soon, International Women's Day protests are coming up, this issue is quite important, you know, saying that this isn't taboo, saying that having your period isn't being dirty or shameful, uh, and it's a completely natural thing. And uh, this reflects itself, uh, Mariam, in various uh, uh, levels in society, even, you know, products designed for a sanitary towel, mm -hmm. you know, look at the language. When you go into a supermarket and you look at the packaging, everything is sanitized, there's no mention of period and and when his towel is blue and it's uh, everything is designed not to touch the sensibilities of uh, mm. of uh, society um, we don't know what that is we know what that is uh, these are exactly the same people who um, are misogynist the core of it is and and that's part of a chal uh, challenge to this taboo uh, look at the education system mm. for young people how uh, girls and boys are already uh, been educated in sort of not discussing it mm. and being completely ignorant yeah. of, of yeah. this issue. So, and that's another aspect. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I got my period when I was 11, I had no idea what it was. And I, I, I thought I had cut myself or something. And again, it wasn't something that was taught in schools in Iran then. And I know there's this constant challenge, isn't there, with, uh, you know, conservative parents and in many societies where this sort of uh, education about your body, about sex, all of these things are still taboo. Even in European countries, you know, there's a fight going on with parents that are trying to stop these sort of educational things taking place in schools. And so it's, it's an important taboo to break for every society. And it's important for women to feel very comfortable with their periods and also to recognize that it's completely natural, there's nothing shameful in it. Since it is International Women's Day coming up soon, Sadia Hamid and myself, we've done an action to break the taboo uh, of periods, that it's dirty, that it's something that it should be embarrassing or shameful, and uh, as a criticism as well of Islamic states, religions, and uh, the sort of institutionalized misogyny that looks at it unfavorably uh, uh, and, and puts pressure on women, secludes them, excludes them, and tries to segregate them, and girls as well. Yes, uh, amazing action again, uh, uh, Mariam and Sadia, and I think this is something everybody needs to support. It's for uh, um, uh, health of society, uh, men, women, girls and boys, young people, old people, everybody needs to participate to break this taboo. Yeah, onwards towards 8th March, International Women's Day, breaking the taboo about periods. Full stop. Uh, the Salman Rushdie affair uh, was divided into the heroes and the cowards. Uh, so there were those who understood the principles that were at stake, who didn't uh, have very much understanding of what we all see now, which is the, um, you know, the, the, the inexorable rise of fundamentalism. And so they were quite haughty in their understanding of this ridiculous thing. and they. But they were very brave. Uh, so Ian McEwan was very brave. Uh, Blake Morrison was very brave. The publishers uh, were very brave. Former pub former editors were very brave. But they all knew that they could uh, be killed. Uh, because, of course, the fatwa was not just against Salman. It was against uh, uh, the publishers. So what we did in the, uh, the, our free-floating world that doesn't have reference to anything else is we carried on uh, being there for Salman. So there were any number of literary events at which there would be a mystery guest would turn out to be Salman. So he was very much part of uh, our, our, our literary world continuously. I think we're in, uh, I know we're in a very, very uh, dangerous place now because the, uh, the, the rise of um, religious extremism um, is, seems to be unstoppable 
And I do feel, um, as a person uh, connected to the network of, uh, of Penn, uh, that, that there's very little understanding in the traditional uh, political institutions and, and the uh, traditional media, the very little understanding of what the real issues are. It's almost as if they're still locked into the tail end of uh, the, the Cold War, 1989 uh, uh, to be precise. They haven't figured out how to um, analyze and unravel the, the, the situation that we have now. And it has been very difficult to explain to the younger generation who are coming um, from an unbounded social media background and they're trying to um, um, bound that world, world. But we haven't yet understood how to explain to our younger generation how, uh, how dangerous it is to take the, um, uh, the side of the censors. The fatwa against Rushdie, the burning of satanic verses, had a huge impact uh, and reverberated around the world. As an organization run, uh, for black and minority women, South of Black Sisters, we were totally shaken to the core by the level of animosity, hostility that was being displayed to what was in effect a book. A, a writer's imagination, a writer's literary imagination, a creative piece of writing. So we had newly formed uh, Women Against Fundamentalism because we understood that this was not uh, just about um, defending the, the work of a, one particular writer, but it was about something much more bigger than we had imagined, something that had taken us all by surprise which was the way in which religion was being used to clamp down on free speech, freedom of expression, um, and freedom of conscience. We were really concerned by what we were seeing was in effect the warning signs of fundamentalism that was on the rise throughout the world. Forming Women Against Fundamentalism, we decided that our first act had to be to defend Salman Rushdie's right to write, the right to dissent. And the reason we did that was because up until that moment, the debate in the media and in the public was only, was a binary one. It was either liberal literary people who were coming out in defend of Rushdie's right to write, or it was the uh, Muslim fundamentalists who claiming to speak on behalf of all Muslims arguing that he had committed blasphemy. What we were concerned about was that there were no progressive voices of activism, of uh, political movements of the left, of feminists, standing up and saying that what was happening to Rushdie was something far more significant than just about the right to be creative. So we decided to demonstrate against a large fundamentalist demonstration that had been organized calling for the death of Salman Rushdie and supporting the fatwa and calling for the banning of the book. Um, we knew that it was going to be a large demonstration because um, a large uh, army of of people who had been galvanized in a very emotional way. People who'd never read the book had been galvanized in defense of so-called Islam. And, but even when we arrived at Parliament Square where we decided to wait as a group of black and white women, feminists, we were about 40 women. And when we waited at Parliament Square, we were taken aback by the thousands upon thousands of largely young, angry Muslim men led by clerics, so-called community leaders with transnational fundamentalist links, which was never properly explored by the media, who were leading this uh, defense of the religion. Um, we did not expect the kind of vitriol, the uh, aggressive, violent, reaction that we got. We stood there with our placards and slogans um, which said, fear is your weapon, courage is ours, 
religious leaders don't speak for us, our traditions struggle not submission, our bodies, our minds, we have the right to choose our own destinies. These were some of our slogans. We stood there in peaceful protest to show the world that there wasn't just a binary battle between the literary establishment and fundamentalists, but there were progressives who were standing up for what was right. Um, and we were attacked. We, our, our banner, they lunged for us to break, uh, to tear our banner. And if it hadn't been for the police, ironically, that formed a cordon around them and us, we probably would have been injured, even fat fatally injured. The, the ironic thing is that the same time that we were protesting against the fanatics, um, a group of fascists of the far right had also turned up about, I think they were a part of a splinter fascist movement that was also trying to oppose the Muslim demonstration to parade their own kind of fascism and anti-Muslim racism. But when they realized that they couldn't face off uh, the huge army that was before them, they turned to us because we were the easier target. So the irony and the paradox of that moment is that we were both chanting down with fundamentalism and then turning around to the far right and shouting down with racism at one and the same time. For us, that moment has encapsulated and embodied the kind of politics we stand for, which is one that says you have to face many directions at once without prioritizing any struggle against oppression, one form of oppression over another. And that remains our politics now. I think one of the key lessons for us is that we have to really understand and be vigilant to the warning signs. This is not just about some disenfranchised group of people who are deprived, who are struggling for their rights. This is the very opposite. This is about authoritarian movements that want to stamp down on fledgling democratic movements for peace, for tolerance, for rights, for human rights, for universal human rights. This is about clamping down on humanity and progress. So I think people have been slow to understand that warning sign that the right to dissent is the lifeblood of any democracy. And dissenting is so important now than ever when we are faced with worldwide uh, authoritarianism of one kind or another, where journalists, writers, artists, activists, lawyers are being put behind bars or killed for their beliefs, for standing up for what is right, for daring to disagree with the status quo. We seem to have moved and drifted towards the right with our eyes shut. That's what it felt like 30 years ago, was that too many people were turning a blind eye or remaining silent for what? For what? Because they didn't want to be accused of being racist or Islamophobic. It's made no difference. 30 years later, we have those accusations now more entrenched in the way in which the state deals with minorities, the state deals with religion, facilitates fundamentalism, the way in which the media deals with these issues, where now fundamentalism is now more entrenched than it was, and we are heading in one direction only if we don't stop. As If we call ourselves the progressive left, we really have to do something about this. For me, I did not appreciate 30 years ago that 30 years later we would be struggling in defense of secularism, in defense of human rights, in defense of the idea of that, that there is such a thing as a shared humanity. 30 years ago I knew that we were dealing with something big, but just how big even I or, and my colleagues probably didn't realize. Now more than ever, we are going to have to amplify the voices of those civilians. It's not people like us, but it's the civilians around the world 
who are brave and courageous enough to stand up against fundamentalism, to refuse to underestimate it, to refuse to see this as just a little blip in world politics. This has now, fundamentalism, authoritarianism, the far right, the religious right, has mainstreamed itself into societal structures, into the law, into political spaces, into cultural spaces. And we now have even more of an uphill task than we did 30 years ago. Well, when the Satanic Verses was published, nobody was very interested in questions of religion. Even though the Iranian Revolution and the counter-revolution had taken place 10 years before, it hadn't really percolated into British consciousness. So when we had a meeting and said we want to have this and issued a statement at the end of the meeting, uh, the meeting was on religious fundamentalism, and we, uh, South Hall Black Sisters had it with the lab local women's labor party, and we said we want to have this meeting on religious fundamentalism, they said okay, but they didn't really know why, you know, why, why are we talking about religion? You know, it's a very strange thing to talk about. And then we issued this statement in support of Rushdi, and it was like a thunderclap. Um, because people didn't understand it. But you know, at that time, there was a progressive anti-racist movement which was very supportive of us. I want to make this point really clearly. We had support from the anti-racist movement. One of the grand men of um, uh, really black liberation uh, called John LaRose, who ran a book fair called The Third World I think Black Radical and Progressive Book Fair, uh, something like that. And it had publishers from all over the world. It had a lot of uh, extremely interesting uh, talks and so on. He made a statement in support of Rushdi. He read South Old Black Sister's statement. He really put the protective arm of an older brother in the anti-racist movement around us. You know, so it's not true that we were completely vilified. Yes, we had flack. But there was that presence there which we don't see so visible any longer. There were a number of responses because there were, there were people like the uh, first black MP, Bernie Grant, who said, and you'll see it in the film later, uh, said if, if, if Rushdie wants to criticize Muslims, let him go to Saudi Arabia. And he made a lot of absurd statements. Uh, but there were other people who completely understood the issue. And they were from progressive uh, uh, parties. They were from the far left. They were from... Uh, the uh, Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn spoke here in Conway Hall, sitting beside me, uh, about, uh, in support of Rushdie. Uh, uh, Tariq Ali, who was um, uh, my producer, you know, he, he ran the channel, uh, Bandung File, the program that the, the films were made for. He was very keen on making anti fundamentalist films. So there were a lot of very clear thinking older left people who were very, very clear about this issue. And yes, there was opposition, but that opposition now, this is the point I want to make, it's much worse now than it was 30 years ago. What we call the regressive left or the postmodernist left wasn't as entrenched then as it was now. You saw the beginnings of it, you saw some of those arguments, but they've got so well developed that even with the mass murders like Charlie Hebdo, people are feeling different. Or they feel that Charlie Hebdo cartoonists brought it on themselves. And they, you know, they're, they're indifferent to the attacks on Jews and the supermarket attack. They're indifferent to the fact that there's very clear armed violence aimed at specific groups of people, which include atheists, which include writers and cartoonists, which include Jews, uh, which include all religious minorities. I mean, they're very, very specific groups of people being attacked in very organized ways. And yet it's always seen as, you know, just some oppressed man who got a little bit, you know, too oppressed and suddenly, you know, woke up and attacked people. It's not spontaneous like that. Uh, I mean, the, the ideology is trying to get people to make spontaneous attacks. And that, it wasn't happening at that level at that time. What we were mostly dealing with was racism of the wider community and the sexism also of the wider community and within our own community. So we had two or three fights on our hands and the religious fundamentalism issue was actually added onto that. At that time, the community leaders we were fighting were secular. They were patriarchal, but they were secular. And we were fighting them. But now, many of the community leaders of the government favors are actually fundamentalists. The dissenting movements have grown. 
the ex-Muslim movement, obviously, that's a huge worldwide movement. There's an understanding of some of these issues. Women's coalitions have grown over this period. I mean, we were already part, I was part of uh, the Women Living Under Muslim Laws Coalition, which was all across the world. So Pakistani women were opposing Islamicization in Pakistan. You will see in the film the Iranian women speaking about what happened in Iran, saying, don't make the mistake of thinking that hijab is liberation. You were saying it at H and I. So those understandings were there, and certainly the people who hold to that view, the, the networks have grown stronger. Um, so in some ways the, the, the resistance and the understanding is stronger, but the opposition from the liberals is also stronger. The lesson is you must never apologize for blaspheming. Never apologize. Carry on doing what you need to do. If people can't live with blasphemy, it means that they're part of a violent political movement. It's not just about their oppression. Well, clearly, uh, when uh, the Satanic versus uh, fatwa happened against Salman Rushdie, uh, it was an indication of what uh, was going to come in the world. And we're seeing very clearly now that 30 years on, there are many blasphemy laws that didn't exist 30 years ago. And also, it's become very difficult to blaspheme, uh, even in countries that are secular, and where no blasphemy laws exist. Uh, one of the things that Salman Rushdie says is that, uh, you know, what scares uh, those in power of writers is that they're not promoting the official narrative, and that scares them because that's the narrative that powers in, that those in power want to be sure are imposed. And so, in a sense, that's what blasphemy is, isn't it? Going against the official narrative and uh, dissenting in a way that brings down the walls and challenges power in a way that is very difficult to do and that's the importance of Salman Rushdie's work, why the satanic verses need to be defended, why Charlie Hebdo needs to be defended, but also why so many of those who are on apostasy and blasphemy sentences in Iran, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, across the world really need to be defended because defending them is defending fundamental freedom of expression, which is everyone's right, religious and non-religious. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators. <laughs> 